The grace gifts of leadership, or more accurately, servant leadership, are listed as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, or pastor-teachers, depending on your interpretation. The gift of foundational apostleship is no longer our concern, as no one today fits the criteria to be a foundational apostle. The teachings of the foundational apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, are what the church is built upon. Christ being the chief cornerstone and foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, and 11. The apostles were those who saw the Lord while he was on earth before he ascended into heaven, 1 Corinthians 9, 1. And the Lord did true signs, wonders, and miracles through them to authenticate their ministries, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. They wrote, many of them wrote scripture, Matthew, John, Peter, Paul, etc., they were persecuted, and all but one, John, were martyred for the faith. First uh, Corinthians 4, 9, and the pre-Nicene Fathers' writings. Finally, Paul said that he was the last, in sequence, of the original foundational apostles. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 7, and 8. We are to use the word of God through Jesus Christ, taught to us by the apostles and prophets, as the basis for our Christian life. 2 Peter 3, 2, Jude 17. There's no one today who can meet the biblical criteria to be a foundational apostle. But there are apostles in the church today. They're sent out ones, messengers, mainly church planning missionaries. But they're not foundational to the church. The gift of prophecy is also somewhat different today. There are no longer any foundational prophets, Ephesians 2.20. Those who wrote scripture, such as Samuel, Daniel, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc., who were often martyred for the faith, Luke 11, 47 through 48, Revelations 18, 24. Though some may yet be killed in our day, and upon whom the church has its foundation, 2 Peter 3, 2, in Christ the foundation and cornerstone, 1 Peter 2, 6. There are prophets today, I believe, but they are also to be held up to the same standards as any biblical prophet. What they prophesy must be biblical, and what they predict must come true. Uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 and 18, 20. Otherwise, they're, be, they're to be considered false prophets, and the church should not listen to them. Jeremiah 23, 16, Matthew 7, 15, 2 Peter 2, uh, 11, John 4, 1, etc. This criteria also applies to any of the grace gifts. If evangelists are preaching a false gospel, Galatians 1.9. If pastors and teachers are not teaching sound doctrine, 2 Timothy 4.3, Titus 1.9, and 2.1. They are all to be regarded as heretics and rejected after a few admonitions. If they do not repent, Titus 3.10. Today, the main role of a prophet is to exegete the written word through which Jesus Christ speaks, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, to instruct and edify the church, 1 Corinthians 14, 31. He doesn't rely on his own interpretations, 2 Peter 1, 20. The Holy Spirit speaks through the living word, Hebrews 4, 12, which we are not to go beyond, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And out of that, comes the guidance of the Lord for his church. Hey, the Bible is living and active. As a prophet elaborates upon the word, prophecy for the church today comes forth. The Lord can and still does speak through uh, dreams and visions, Acts 2.17. But dreams and visions must be tested, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, by the scripture, 2 Timothy 3.15-16, through 16, which is our highest authority. As the Holy Spirit Breathe the words through men, the very word of God. It's the word of God. I would also add that you can be sure that those who give themselves the title of apostle or prophet today or super apostle like C. Peter Wagner, tooting their own horn loudly in the public arena, those are false apostles. 2 Corinthians 11.13 and false prophets. Mark 13.22. Now the roles of evangelist, pastor, and teacher continue today as they did in the first century. Yet, let's look at what they have to say. Wagner and his crew of NAR claim that they are foundational apostles today. And um, I've got a whole teaching on this, and this is coming out in this new book. It's not in any of my books yet, but it's coming out in this new book, Apostles and Prophets, The Foundation of the Church. And um, I, I identify with James in terms of my function as an apostle, as a horizontal apostle to bring together the body, people in the body of Christ. Not only can I do it, I love to do it. 
I love to do it. I mean, yesterday I, I was the apostle with a group of about 15 or 20 prophets. We met all day long. And these prophets, many of whom are going to be speakers in this conference, come under my guidance and coordination and leadership as an apostle. They each have apostles in their own networks, but I mean, that they're under spiritually. But I'm the one that brings them together, and when I bring them together, things happen. Because that's an anointing that God has given to a horizontal apostle. So once I knew that, then I knew why I was different from these people, and I knew I was a horizontal apostle, and uh, I began using the, um, the term in public. Okay, so that's just my own process, personal process of getting there. That was point two. <clears throat> point three, see point two is that apostles are crucial. <clears throat> and point three is that prophets are crucial. <clears throat> now prophets must be hitched to apostles. And I want to uh, quote for you 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, don't, don't forget. 1 Corinthians 12 is the most detailed chapter on spiritual gifts in the whole Bible. Okay. So we have a lot of detail about spiritual gifts. Part of 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says this. Or part of, part of 1 Corinthians 12 is 28, which says this. And God, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets. Everybody say first. first. Everybody say second. second. So this is a very important distinction First apostles, second prophets, then third teachers, and then, th then um, it goes on. Now, apostles, the government of the church <clears throat> does not end with apostles and prophets. They're not the only people in the government of the church. But I'll tell you one thing, it begins with them. It says so right here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. First apostles, second prophets. Therefore, prophets need apostles because of their governmental grace and fatherly wisdom. So Peter Wagner is recognized in our church congregation as a man with a strong apostolic ministry and a man that operates in the office of an apostle. But there is something of that ministry that must be restored. I tell you, there is a radical change coming to pastoral ministry in the church. We are not going to make it into what is coming without the foundation that the Lord established. The Lord Jesus himself is the only foundation, and it's got to be apostol apostles and prophets who laid the foundation. God is releasing true apostolic and true prophetic ministry. They're going to bond. Right now, there's something of a war going on. But I tell you, ultimately, you're going to see a union. So it's very important that we begin to understand and recognize these gifts, see if we're motivated by the gift, but know that we can all have a manifestation of the gift, and then some of us God will begin to use in a more governmental way to see the body of Christ established and moving forward. And so that those two anointings especially are able to access heaven and get the revelation needed to where the church is going, to where individuals are going, to where the world is moving. And when you get those dimensions on you, you're able to lead people. Philip Powell of Christian Witness Ministries comments. When, uh, when uh, Peter Wagner came, uh, they put out a um, leaflet, uh, which is, absolutely amazed me. This was in February 2000. And I was doing a tour here. I was based in New Zealand at the time. And somebody handled, handed me this, this uh, brochure. And I, I read the, the material. It was incredible. He, this, is, this is how it's presented. The New Apostolic Reformation is an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit that is changing the shape of Christianity globally. It is truly a new day, it goes on to say. The church is changing. New names, new methods, new worship expressions. And then this. The Lord is establishing the foundations of the church for the new millennium. This foundation is built upon apostles and prophets. Now, one of the sad effects of this is that it's sucking in a lot of good people. Uh, for example, Bill Newman, who is noted as one of Australia's leading evangelists and a person that I've always respected and admired, uh, came out in support of this. And this is what he said. He said, this 21st century church conference may well prove to be the most important investment of your time in the light of your future ministry. This is one conference not to miss. And then he said this, just imagine 
if you had missed the day of Pentecost. Uh, we pointed out in our journal, Contending Earnestly for the Faith, of course, that none of us is old enough to uh, be, have been present on the day of Pentecost. And, and personally, I for one am glad that I missed uh, the conference because really, it's absolutely heretical. The statement is absolute error. The words of Paul, a true apostle, are probably most apt in this connection. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, he says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now, obviously, it's not within my um, mandate to explain uh, the um, nature of this, but I would like to make one or two comments. Um, the thing, if, it, if anything is wrong doctrinally, basically wrong, fundamentally wrong, then the pra practical outworking of it will be wrong. Uh, those of us who have been studying the Bible for many years will have noted that all of Paul's epistles, for example, uh, start off with doctrine, and then they go on to duty. If the doctrine is wrong, then it will result to wrong living. If the doctrine is right, there's a very good chance of our living correctly. Paul speaks about the foundation of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, he says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. And then this statement, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now the Bible never contradicts itself. Paul establishes the fact that Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. This is the big argument between Protestantism and Roman Catholic position. The Protestant position is that Christ is the foundation of the church. The Roman Catholic position is that Peter is the foundation of the church and the first pope. We as Protestants dispute that. We argue against it. So how can we reconcile this statement of Paul in Corinthians where he says Christ is the foundation with what he says in Ephesians where it appears that he talks about the apostles and prophets as being the foundation. Well, let's read the verse. Second Corinthians, uh, 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 rather, Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. Paul says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now notice he doesn't say we're built upon the apostles and prophets. He says we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which could imply simply this, that the apostles and prophets laid that foundation, which I think is the implication of the statement. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 is another very important passage that has to be taken into account, where, Jesus, where Paul says, Christ, as the head of the church, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Undoubtedly, apostles and prophets do feature, but they do not feature in the sense that they become the foundation, certainly, of the church of our age. Now, the statement of Peter Wagner is heretical for two reasons. First of all, because it elevates what he calls present-day apostles and prophets, who are probably, in all truth, false apostles and prophets, as being the foundation. Then he says that the nature of the church and of Christianity is going to change. Now, Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If the nature of Christianity changes and the nature of the church changes, then, of course, Christ's statement does not carry through and his statement falls to the ground. Christianity has been established by our Lord Jesus Christ. It will not change. The church, the true church, is built upon Jesus Christ. He is the head. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the foundation, the chief cornerstone, everything of the church. 
and he said he would build it. These churches that they are talking about are their own churches. They are not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've encountered quite a lot of um, problems as a result of this, not only within the Pentecostal charismatic scene, which is my background, although I don't like the word charismatic, um, I consider myself to be more a classic Pentecostal and we placed a great deal of emphasis and importance upon doctrine in all of my training and in all of my ministry. And I've been in the ministry for now over 40 years and it's always been doctrine as the basis of everything. I like to think of myself as a classic Pentecostal but my function has been in that area although now I'm finding that some of the more traditional churches are opening their doors uh, to us because they are being influenced by what we call the funny stuff and they look to us for some direction and help. Uh, shortly after this conference that Peter Wagner put on here in Brisbane, uh, I was doing a ministry in Melbourne and I met a person from a traditional church and he came to me and said that his pastor had been up in this um, conference and he said when he came back he, he made an announcement. He said, no, I want all of you, every one of you, to sign a commitment to me and uh, there's going to be no conditions. Uh, you have to commit yourself to me and if not, then you can go elsewhere. Now this godly couple who had been members of the church for quite some time, it wasn't a Pentecostal church, I think it was a congregational church or something of that nature, they came to the pastor and said, look pastor, we're prepared to do this with one proviso, that you say, so long as you keep to the Bible and so long as you keep following the Lord. We are prepared to sign that. No, said the pastor, no conditions, either you sign it or you leave. These, this godly couple said, well, I'm sorry, pastor, we're sorry, we have to leave, and they refused to sign it. What is happening, one of the effects of this uh, stuff, of the apostle and prophet stuff here in Australia and New Zealand, is that the leaders become extremely arrogant, and they start ordering the members around. Now, this in itself proves that there's something wrong. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, if any man have not the spirit, the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ, he does not belong to him. Christ spoke about ministry and he put it in the servant role, not in the area of the executive or the controller or the person who orders the people around. And he says, if any man have not the spirit or disposition of Christ, he is none of his. Or as J.B. Phillips puts it, he doesn't belong to me at all. And this, I think, is one of the acid tests, that the actual attitude of the so-called leaders is changing, and they're moving away from the disposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have no problem with the idea that somebody may be raised up in a modern-day position of being sent with authority from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really the meaning of apostle. Apostolos is a person who is sent uh, like an ambassador uh, or a representative going out with authority. But if he goes out with the authority of Jesus, then surely he must carry with him the very nature of Jesus. If he doesn't have the nature of Jesus, then he will not have the authority of Jesus. I've always felt and said that if the word apostolos from the Greek had been translated instead of transliterated, we wouldn't have had so much problem. Uh, the word simply means an ambassador, or in modern terms, a missionary, one who goes out to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. But when they take on this position of authority and control, I remember uh, the uh, person who was the general superintendent of Assemblies of God, An Andrew Evans, saying shortly after the Rodney Howard Brown thing, uh, he said, well, when they had a dispute in the early church, he said the apostles and the elders got together. And he said, we, the apostles uh, of Australia and the elders have gotten together and we have concluded that this is of God. Well, what has he done? He's taken a New Testament example, an illustration, and he's tried to apply it to a modern setting, but he's ignored all that flowed from that early conference and all that flows from those early apostles, which is, of course, the scripture. We are called today to contend earnestly for the faith. And uh, if we do that, then we will examine everything, as Paul encouraged the Bereans and told them to examine even what he taught. This is what we should do. 
not take a position and say, we have sat and we have decided, but rather we should be humble and examine any dispute, any argument based on scripture. Wagner states, quote, the New Apostolic Reformation is an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit that is changing the shape of Christianity globally. It is truly a new day. The church is changing. New names, new methods, new worship expressions. The, wor the Lord is establishing the foundations of the church for the new millennium. This foundation is built upon prophets, apostles and prophets. Apostles execute and establish God's plan on earth. The time to convene a conference of the different apostolic prophetic streams across the nation is now. This conference will cause the body to understand God's new order for this coming era. We look forward to having you with us in Brisbane in, in, Brisbane in uh, February 2000. And that was signed by Peter, C. Peter Wagner and Ben Gray. And that was a brochure for Brisbane 2000. Also, quote, I believe that the government of the church is finally coming into place and, and that uh, uh, is what the scripture teaches in Ephesians 2, that the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets. Previously to this decade in the 80s and 90s, we practically ignored prophets and apostles, and now we're seeing what I believe is a major reason. We're going to new levels in prayer. We're going to new levels in the spiritual. We're going to new levels in healings and miracles. We're going to new levels in deliverance of demonic uh, demonic. And so this is the new era we're going into. And I don't know if it's coincidental or what, but it's just that we are moving into a new millennium. Unquote. That's C. Peter Wagner of CBN interview on January 3rd, 2000. Jacob Prash, evangelist and apologist for Morial Ministries, comments on the argument for there being foundational apostles today. The question put to me is, are there foundational apostles and prophets today? We address this in response to the so-called prophet apostle movement being propagated by Peter Wagner, Cindy Jacobs, Bill Hammond and others associated with this particular movement. Uh, again in reaction to their fairly recent rally in Colorado. Foundational. Jesus is called in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, Ho Apostolo, the apostle with the definite article. We have five categories of apostle in the New Testament, essentially five. The first of these is the Lord Jesus himself. He is the apostle, again, with a definite article in the Greek text. All apostolic authority must derive from Jesus. He is the apostle. The word apostle, apostolo in Greek, shaliak in Hebrew, means literally one who was sent. One who was sent, of course, to plant or begin a church. The second category of apostle we have are the 12 apostles. They had to be around from the time of the baptism of John and see the Lord Jesus personally. Even Paul would not have qualified to be among the twelve. He'd not been around from the baptism of John, according to the book of Acts. Third category would be the somewhat unique case of Paul. Paul had co-equal authority with the other twelve apostles. He said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as if he were actually present at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper. Paul saw the Lord and Paul had co-equal authority with the Twelve, he was something of a unique case. The fourth category of apostle are those like Barnabas, those like him who met some of the criteria of the Twelve. So far, we've looked at four listings of the apostles. Jesus is with us in the Holy Spirit. He is the apostle. But the twelve, Paul, or even men like Barnabas who saw the Lord, do not exist today and cannot. The only category of apostle that can exist today is the fifth category, represented by Apollos. In 1 Corinthians, where Paul attacks the sin of party spirit in the church, he says, some say I am of Cephas, Peter, some of Paul, some of Apollos. Apollos did not see the Lord as far as we have any biblical record. Apollos was a church planting missionary. The only kind of apostle we can have today is a church planting missionary. Someone sent by one church to plant another. Normally and biblically, this should be done in pairs. And the apostles themselves are accountable to the church that sent them out. Much in the example of Paul and Barnabas, they reported back to the elders and leaders at Antioch who commissioned them according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
What you see being propagated today by men like Peter Wagner and Cindy Jacobs has absolutely no biblical foundation whatsoever. Now, I myself believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe there's prophetic ministry in the church today. I believe there's apostolic ministry in the church today as the Bible teaches it. Not according to the way Peter Wagner and his friends are deceiving people into believing. There is absolutely no biblical premise for this. It is what is in Great Britain known as Restorationism. The Restoration Movement attempts to restore three things which never existed. The first thing they tried to restore is their version of apostolic authority, where you have a hierarchical system of an apostle over a city based on the pyramid misconstruction of the text of Ephesians of the fivefold ministry, where the apostles on the top, under that is the prophet. What these men are really calling apostolic, and min apostolic ministry is in effect nothing more than heavy shepherding. Jesus despised the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We don't know exactly who the Nicolaitans were, and scholars are divided as to who Nicolaus may have been. But we know what the word means in Greek. Nico, suppression of the laity, heavy shepherding. Ezekiel 44 castigates the heavy shepherds. They exploit the sheep. What Peter Wagner and his friends are calling apostolic ministry is without biblical foundation, and it obviously is something that only leads to heavy shepherding and abuse and exploitation of the sheep. Now, the second category of this restoration is the prophetic ministry. We're told in Hebrews again that in former times God spoke through the prophets. In the last days, he's speaking through his son. Apostolic authority still exists in the writing of the apostles. Apostolic authority was concerned with one thing, the definition of doctrine. The apostles interpreted the rest of the Bible for us. Think of the epistles as an inspired commentary. It's a commentary on the rest of the Bible, but it's God's commentary. It's directly inspired by the Holy Spirit working and writing through the apostles. We read the rest of the scripture through the prism of what the apostles wrote. If you want to know what Jesus meant, read the epistles. If you want to know what Leviticus means, read Hebrews. If you want to know what the law means, read Romans and Galatians. We read the rest of the Bible through the prism of apostolic commentary. The apostles had authority to define doctrine. We see this in Acts chapter 15. That's the true meaning of binding and loosing. Luo and deo in Greek translations of the Hebrew words hetir and asur. This apostolic authority being exercised in Acts 15 was to define doctrine over the question of the circumcision of Gentiles, eating food, idolatry, things which are strangled in blood based on the Noahide covenants from the book of Genesis. It has nothing to do with what binding and loosing is being told today. Absolutely nothing. It's not what binding and loosing means. It's simply not what it means. They are making it into something completely different. It's a complete nonsense. It's not what the words mean. Now, I'd be willing and happy to debate C. Peter Wagner anywhere, as long as it was in front of a video camera or a television camera and available to the Christian public. i debate him anywhere because he's teaching people deception and falsehood. He's a man who deceives in many ways. But let's continue looking at the second thing the Restorationists tried to restore. Their version of prophetic authority. Again, in previous times, God spoke through the prophets. There are no more prophets like Isaiah or Amos or Habakkuk. Why? Because they wrote the Old Testament as the apostles wrote the New. We have defined doctrine. You can't add anything to the Old Testament, and you can add nothing to the New. There is no new revelation. What there will be in the last days is a clearer understanding of what is already in the Bible, but there is no new doctrine. And the binding and loosing ideas and the restorationist ideas are new doctrine. They have no biblical, absolutely no biblical grounds whatsoever. Biblically, a prophet, even in the New Testament, would speak for the exhortation, warning, correction of the body. There's much we can say to distinguish between a false prophet and a true one, but the clearest test is someone who predicts things that don't happen. Now, again, the same as you cannot have apostles like Peter and Paul, you cannot have prophets like Isaiah or even Agabus in the New Testament. Old Testament prophets are gone because the New Testament is now written, the Old Testament is a completed canon. 
The most we can have are New Testament prophets, like the ones who warned Paul in the book of Acts. They didn't write any scripture or define any doctrine, but they did, among other things, warn the church. Nonetheless, his prophecy came to pass. It was true. Why do men like Benny Hinn prophesy things that don't happen? I was in New Zealand recently, and the Assemblies of God in New Zealand issued a statement saying they will not allow Benny Hinn back into New Zealand because of financial misconduct, as they considered it to be unethical, but also because of his prophecies that didn't come to pass. Why do men like Rick Joyner predict things that don't happen? Well, the scripture says because Rick Joyner is a proven false prophet. The same would be no less true of men like General Coates in England. They prophesy that which does not transpire. That is true of Rodney Howard Brown, above all, Rick Joyner, and not least of all, the Kansas City prophets, particularly and most notably Mike Bickle and Paul Kane. They came to Great Britain in August of 1990 and before a sizable amount of people, falsely prophesied in the name of the Lord that the greatest revival in Britain's history was going to come in October of 1990 and fan out onto continental Europe, particularly Germany. Well, in the 11 years since the false prophecies of Paul Kane, the false prophet, and Mike Bickle, the false prophet, and Bob Jones, the false prophet, who was found in immorality, we've had more mosques built in England than churches. Who had the revival? Islam? Mormonism? They're growing. Evangelical Christianity has done nothing but decline. In fact, in the last 10 years in Great Britain, we've had a 22% decline in church attendance. These men are the false prophets Jesus warned would come in the last days to deceive the elect. Now, part of the lie of these people is we shouldn't test them biblically. I w recently watched the video of Bill Hammond saying we're not called to judge prophecy or prophets. But we read in 1 Corinthians, let two or three prophesy and let the others pass judgment. Let the prophets speak and let the others judge it. Is Paul a liar or is Bill Hammond a liar? One of them must be a liar. Or, at best, a blithering ignoramus. Who do I believe? The word of God or Bill Hammond? They prophesy falsely. Mike Bickle says a prophet does not always have to be right. You know, before I was born again, before I immigrated to Israel, there was a witch in New Jersey. I lived in New York. She was in New Jersey. She could read my tarot cards and prophesy, as it were, with the spirit of divination with considerable accuracy. Her track record, prediction for prediction, was much higher than Mike Bickle's or Paul Kane's. Does that make her a true prophet, a true prophetess? No, she had a lying spirit. Well, so does Mike Bickle and Paul Kane, by the same definition. We're told three times in the book of Proverbs that an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. False prophetic prediction made in the Lord's name makes the Jehovah's Witnesses false prophets. Charles Tazzy Russell is a false prophet. By biblical definition, so is Judge Rutherford. So is Joseph Smith of the Mormons. They've all predicted things in God's name that didn't happen. Well, that is no less true of Benny Hinn, of Mike Bickle, of Paul Kane, and above all, Rick Joyner. If you look at these people, they're basically screaming hype artists. What would an unsaved person think of a woman like Cindy Jacobs? I can't help but remark that she ought to be on Prozac. Instead, she's on television. This is just not right, friends. There's something wrong. This looks absolutely insane. What would an unsaved person think? They would think that this woman needs to be on medication for her own protection. It's raging lunacy. This is not biblical prophecy. Nothing to do with it. So the second thing the restorationists try to restore is a version of prophetic ministry that is not biblical, where they can predict things, get it wrong, and still be considered prophets. The third thing they try to restore is what a theologian would call over-realized eschatology, something they erroneously misunderstand by not properly comprehending the writings of the late theologian George Olden Ladd. In the 1940s and 50s, it was known as Manifest Sons, Latter-day Reign, then Joel's Army. It was banned by the Assemblies of God and by mainstream Pentecostalism in the 40s and 50s. Today, it's become mainstream. It is Kingdom Now, Dominionism, a strange combination of extreme Calvinism called Reconstructionism. The idea is theonomy. The church is going to conquer the whole world for Christ before he comes and set up his kingdom. Kingdom Dominion Theology. It comes from, again, extreme reformed Calvinists. People like the late Rousseau Rushduni, Gary North, people like David Shulton, Greg Bonson, 
people with whom James D. D. James Kennedy are associated, Gary DeMar. Absolutely preposterous ideas. Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. The Bible speaks plainly of an antichrist, of a great falling away, and of a rapture. Things that people caught up in dominion theology deny. Men like Rick Godwin of Eagle's Nest in Texas, and the other proponents of kingdom dominion theology are teaching a false, false message and giving people a false hope. His kingdom is not of this world. There is a rapture. There is an apostasy, a deception, and a falling away. That's what the Bible teaches. The restoration movement is trying to restore three things which never existed. A false prophetic authority, a false apostolic authority, and a false eschatology. Now there is a true apostolic authority, the writings of the apostles. Here is apostolic authority, what they wrote. There is a true prophetic authority. There are people today who are warning the church. They may not call themselves prophets. True prophets don't have to. It's only false prophets who call themselves prophets. The prophet Amos said, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. A true prophet doesn't even want the job. Only a false one does. When you see somebody calling themselves a prophet, right away that should be an indication they're a false one. Now, I do believe there are people God is speaking to the church today through prophetically. I would say Dave Hunt is one of them. I would say David Wilkerson in New York is another. These men may not be perfect, but they're godly men, they're honest men, and they're telling the truth. There's a real prophetic authority, and a real apostolic authority, and a true eschatology, a true teaching of the return of Jesus Christ. What these people have done, caught up in the Peter Wagner nonsense, is they have replaced the Word of God with Gnosticism and subjective mystical revelation, false prophecy. That's the Word of God to them. Instead of the Word of God being prophecy, it is their mystical Gnosticism. It is a nonsense. Now I would also warn that Peter Wagner is less than forthcoming and less than honest in what he writes, in many ways. Peter Wagner has been big on getting the model right when he came to Fuller Seminary. He would go to South America, for instance, and see where there were tremendous revivals of people being saved and have the programmatic idea that if you get the right formula, the churches will grow, giving no place to the sovereignty of God. Well, even there, he's not been honest. Not at all. In Latin America and the Philippines, where these revivals are happening, it is the equivalent of what happened in, Ref in the Reformation in Western Europe. What he does not tell people in the United States or Western Europe is this, that the tremendous church growth in Latin America is dominated by people leaving Roman Catholicism as they left Roman Catholicism in the Reformation. The only place you see the ecumenism of men like Chuck Colson and worse Peter Wagner is in the dying Protestant countries where evangelical Protestantism is a dying religion. Where God is indeed working and a lot of people are being saved people are leaving Roman Catholicism in very big numbers. That is what is happening in Brazil, it's what's happening in Guatemala, it's what's happening in Mexico. It is why the, the Pope keeps going back to South America, condemning evangelical Christians. They are leaving the Roman Church. They are not ecumenical, they are anti-ecumenical, they are coming to the same realization that Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli did in the 16th century. Remember, the founders of Protestantism were not Protestants. They were Roman Catholic priests who read the Bible. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Aquampadius, Bucer, Cranmer, every one of them were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy who read the Word of God and realized there was a different gospel than the one that Jesus and the Apostles taught. Peter Wagner has not told the truth. The first thing that Peter Wagner would need to do to see the South American way God is working work in America is not be ecumenical, but he is. Now again, in no way am I against Catholic people. My mother's family is Catholic. My family is a combination of Catholic and Jewish. I love Jews and I love Catholics. But above all, I love the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word. I myself am a moderate Pentecostal. But I also know there's a false Pentecostalism today, and it's what Peter Wagner represents. His version of apostles, prophets, and what goes with it are the very deceptions Jesus said to look out for. The NAR also claims that there are female apostles today. Naomi Dowdy has said yes from Singapore. She has a church of 5,000 there. I, how many people are under her 
apostolic network that she works with in the assemblies. I think I heard maybe a thousand or something. She's going to teach a course on the woman as a pastor. See, the apostle, I, like I said before, uh, uh, submits, but the apostle hum, uh, humbles himself or herself to the prophet. You know, the prophetic anointing is, is really breaking out in all, all nations. And we're scheduled to go to China in the month of January. And many of the Chinese Christians uh, that we're coming into contact with, some of them had never received the prophetic word. And they never ha even heard of prophets. And they are just embracing it. And we had two of our female apostolic leaders to leave and fly to China and go into China and make the contacts with the Chinese church and began to prophesy over them. We're finding out that a lot of the Chinese apostolic leaders are women. And, and we had two women from our church that really did the apostolic work to go into China. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Ariel Ministries comments on the concept of female apostles. And furthermore, all apostles were men. There was no such thing as female apostles because the New Testament has some key things about women exercising spiritual authority over men. So all apostles were men only. You know, they also claim that youth can be apostles and they have apparently laid hands on many and told them they are now foundational apostles. In, in Ethiopia, we had the privilege of ordaining five individuals into apostolic ministry. We ordained a young man from Egypt. We ordained a young man from Ethiopia. We ordained a young man from South Africa. We ordained a young man from Singapore. And we ordained a young man from the nation of Mauritius. And everywhere we go now, we're, we're seeing uh, people being set into apostolic offices. This year, uh, Brother Peter was in Singapore, of course, commissioning uh, a man of God there in Singapore. And we were seeing the release of so many different apostles. In you know, young men may well help with church planning, but, they're also need to be, but they also need to be under the headship of overseers who are older married men, according to the Bible. Uh, they are certainly not foundational to the church. And finally, as stated previously, the NAR claim that there have been no apostles or prophets in the church for various periods of time, all the way back to the first century, according to some, and now foundational apostles and prophets uh, are being restored to the church. But now we live in an hour where apostles are just really beginning to be manifested. Wagner said this, quote, This is a time for apostolic declarations. The church is in a position now characterized by the active and accepted roles of uh, apostles, prophets, and intercessors that it has not experienced in 1,800 years. Unquote. That's C. Peter Wagner, open memorandum addressing the Twin Towers War, S September 14, 2001. According to Wagner, the church has been without apostles, prophets, or prayerful intercessors for 1,800 years. It's a wonder how the church got along at all without this new apostolic reformation, isn't it? Or is it God who builds his church? 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Acts 20.28 20, says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. There are all kinds of anointings mentioned by the New Apostolic Reformation crowd on this video and he's going to bring the synergistic anointing of intercession and the prophetic anointing. And that breaker anointing is going to begin to break the chains. 
And I want to tell you right now, when we get that breach healed, there's a synergy that comes. There's an anointing that takes place. It's exponential in its nature. And all of a sudden, we just shift into another gear. I ask you right now to put that catalytic, germinating, activating, bringing forth anointing in everyone here and let it start working that everyone here before the year's out will be flowing like a river in the prophetic. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is joining the nations. I tell you, there is a synergy taking place. God is doing something in the earth today. He is literally joining the anointing of nations. This nation has an anointing and that one is bringing a new anointing. I've had people ask me, what's some of the main anointings that you have? And I always tell people when they want to become a part of Christian National Ministries Network or they want to come and, and get involved, I say, well, there's four major anointings. The apostolic, prophetic, the reproducing anointing, and then the family anointing. So he brings these things to us as foundational anointings, and when they come together into their fullness, there's a power that just goes like this. And then one that I am uh, uh, very fond of, that I am known for operating in, is the Shamar anointing, the watchman anointing. I believe there is a synergistic joining of a lot of things. I'm going to list some of them. There's a synergistic joining of anointings. And so, but let me tell you about Chuck Pierce. Here he has this prophetic anointing, but here's, here's what's happened because of Chuck's prophetic anointing. Because of Chuck's prophetic anointing, Chuck can feel what I feel. It's going to answer some of the questions about generational curses, generational blessings, generational anointing. Because there was a kingly, princely anointing on him. It's the marriage of the old and the new. And as we do it, the synergistic exponential anointing of the ages through the decree and fullness of the king of the ages is released from generation to generation and from age to age. It is a bringing to its fullness the Christ anointing in the church, which, which is having an exponential uh, effect. It is happening synergistically, exponentially. Other anointings mentioned include the double portion anointing made famous by Benny Hinn. That's the double portion anointing. There's a double portion anointing, brother. They'll come across and literally stop people who are opposing God. Everyone say it's time for the double portion anointing. Everyone say the word complete. There are also quote unquote anointings of Christ. The synergy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, taking the anointings of the Christ and coming to fullness more and more and more, walking in this and this and this and this and this, adding it to this and that, this revelation, that revelation, this understanding, that understanding, this office being restored, that one being restored, this truth, that truth, coming together, adding to it, and the synergy of the Lord Himself. We are told a full anointing is only possible when people join together in unity. And the apostle and the prophet are going to be joined to the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist and all these things are going to be joined together because only when they are do we have the full anointing of the Christ. But when we get this full anointing, the fullness of the Christ anointing flowing, look out. We also have claims there will be a greater release of the anointing. And he's going to fulfill those promises, and he's just been moving through the synergy of the ages to bring us to a greater release of anointing and power. We take the wells of the past. We redig the wells of revival. We redig the wells of anointing. Each generation taking that which was 
restored in the former and adding to it what is restored in the current. These teachings come from a misunderstanding of what the anointing is. There is only one anointing and it's not transferred by human hands or by human will but by Jesus Christ himself. John 15 26 when the counselor comes whom I will send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father he will testify about me. Jesus Christ sends him. Please note that all the passages in Acts and elsewhere are used wrongly by latter rainers to try to prove a transferable impartation of the Holy Spirit use the words through and at the laying on of hands, not by them. Also keep in mind this was during Pentecost. 2 Timothy 1.6 For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 1 Timothy 4.14 Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Um, Acts 8, 18 through 19, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying out of the apostles' hands, he offered the money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. See, he thought that it was by. There are other instances, but there is no indication that a power transfer took place by the laying out of hands or by the will of the apostles. Acts 19.6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. The only conclusion possible from all the biblical passages is that this is not some kind of magic that can be learned and bought for a price, as in the story of Simon the Sorcerer, Acts 8.18-19. 8, and in the way that latter rain, New Apostolic Reformation, uh, false teachers teach it and promote it. True believers, on the other hand, wait upon the Lord. Psalms 27, 14, 38, 15, 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 7. When hands are laid on for the purpose of uh, especially sending Christians out for service, 1 Timothy 4, 14, or praying for healing, James 5, 14, and the Holy Spirit chooses to fill a person or heal them, he does so sovereignly, not by the laying on of hands or by the will of men. None of the apostles or prophets did this the way it's taught and demonstrated by the latter rain heretics. Also, the Bible expressly forbids any transfer of the anointing by men. Uh, Exodus 30, 29-33 says this, You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, This is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on men's bodies and do not make any oil with the same formula. It is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it, whoever puts it on anyone other than a priest, must be cut off from his people. Now God is the one who gives the anointing. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22 There is only one anointing, 1 John 2, 20 which is the anointing of the anointed one, Psalms 2.2, Acts 4.2, who is Jesus Christ, King of Kings. When a person is born again, they are anointed by the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 1.21-22, Ephesians 1.13. They are foreknown, foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified, that's Romans 8.29-30. No one can or should try to transfer the Holy Spirit to another person as the anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit, Luke 4.18, Titus 3.5. This picture of the holy anointing oil in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on everyone who believes and is born again. You know what? I bet most Christians today who have been partially or fully brainwashed by the New Apostolic Reformation don't know that the transferable impartation made popular by movements like Toronto Blessing, Brownsville Outpouring, and false prophets like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Francis, uh, Francis Frangipan, and thousands of others is actually forbidden by Scripture. This fact alone, among many others, completely demolishes the entire basis for the slain in the spirit false anointing. For a final teaching on this subject, let's turn again to Jacob Prash of Morial Ministries. Anointing is simply from the Hebrew word mishcha, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit will anoint different people for different purposes. He'll commission them for different purposes. 
but it's all the Holy Spirit. The way it's broken down in the Bible is completely different than the way these people are. A family anointing, a catalytic anointing, whatever God's name that is. These people are talking absolute nonsense. The Holy Spirit may commission someone, appoint someone to the gift of teaching. Another evangelism. Another to church planting. Another to pastoral ministry. And they may have a true anointing of the Holy Spirit that is a commissioning and an empowering by the Holy Spirit to perform that particular ministry God has called them to. The idea that you have a catalytic anointing or a family anointing or some other... These are non-biblical categories. It's absolute nonsense. You have to understand what these people have done. They have thrown the word of God away and wrote their own. They are doing the exact same thing that took place in the medieval church against which the reformers reacted. They have rewritten their own dogma, their own doctrine. They've abandoned the word of God and replaced it with the inventions of men, something the Lord Jesus condemned. He said, those who did it, how will you escape the judgment of Gehenna? How will you not go to hell? Teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. Men like Bill Hammond are by biblical definition, according to what Jesus himself said, 110% pure Pharisee. They teach as precepts of God the inventions of men. They negate the teaching of scripture with their own tradition and invent their own doctrines seeking to give it doctrinal authority. One of the defining characteristics of the New Apostolic Reformation is the scripture twisting and bad hermeneutics that must be done to come up with their modus operandi. You would think that since so many of their apostles have degrees, many handed out by the Wagner Leadership Institute, that they would be able to exegete the Bible properly. But you can't get to a belief in many of their false doctrines without misusing scripture. You can't believe things like there are foundational apostles today, that women should be in leadership over men, that there are many anointings of the Holy Spirit, that there's a great end times revival before the tribulation, that we are not to discern and test and teach prophecy, that territorial demons can be bound, that cities and nations have souls, all these things. You can't get to them without seriously twisting scripture. Since we will be dealing with some of the subjects I just mentioned in other segments of this video, let me just give you a few examples where scripture is quoted out of context by the new apostles and prophets that illustrate this point. In C. Peter Wagner's International Coalition of Apostles September 14, 2001 open memorandum addressing the Twin Towers War, he uses Matthew 10.34 while trying to prove that Christians should not go on a physical crusade against the Muslims since their organization through YWAM already repented of the uh, crusades with the reconciliation walk. Instead, we should do war in the, heaven, in the heavenlies to free Islam from demonic influences. But Matthew 10.34 in context is about the cross of Christ. The sword is the cross, not spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. The cross splits apart homes and families, even nations. If we cannot stand up for the cross of Christ, we are left on the wrong side of the divide. Two verses before Matthew 10.34, Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. What we don't need are reconciliation walks. What we need is bold witnessing of the gospel message and prayers that God will open the sinful eyes of Muslims so uh, to the Son of God, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mike Bickle gives a teaching based on Daniel 7.10 in the National School of the Prophets video. In Daniel 7.10, the, the uh, fiery stream or the river of fire that breaks forth out of the throne of God, I believe is the person of the Holy Spirit. And when the fire comes forth, the fire is not just judgment, the fire is the revelation of the burning desire of God's heart for people. Now when that burning desire, when rebellion rises up against it, the fire removes that which hinders love and we call it judgment. But the fire breaks forth, his name is the Holy Spirit, and uh, as this fire comes through history, Malachi 3 says the forerunners at the end of the age are going to loose the burning fire. The spirit of burning is the manifestation 
through the house of God in prayer of this river of fire called the Holy Spirit. Bickle tries to equate the fire mentioned in Daniel at the judgment with some kind of fire for revival for the end times. He compares this passage to Daniel uh, in Daniel to Malachi 3, 1 through 4, saying that this is a refining fire. But the fire in Daniel 7.10 is a fire of judgment, which burns up the beast. The fire of Malachi is obviously a prophecy about John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, and has nothing to do with the end times. It has to do with Israel and the Levites. Ted Haggard uses Pro, uh, Proverbs 4.23 to try to prove that prophecy is a flow of God's power into the lives of other people. But the answer that I want to highlight this morning is out of Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. And here when the Bible answers this, here it says, Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Does everybody see that? Above all else, guard your heart. Everybody say guard. Okay, so that means protect your heart from a lot of evil things or wicked things or even natural things because it's a wellspring. Everybody say a wellspring. All right, a wellspring of, and then the key word there is life. See, our, when we flow in the prophetic, when we encourage people in the prophetic, when we make their lives better, it's a flow of life. It's a flow of his life. It's a flow of his power. It's a flow of his words into our community or into our church or into a believer's meeting. Now, this uh, verse is more accurately translated, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It is talking about keeping our hearts in tune with the word of God and his commands because how we live our lives will directly reflect our obedience or disobedience to the Lord. It's not talking about being able to impart some kind of power into people's lives by what we say. What the Lord is looking for is obedience to his commands, not people trying to claim they have powers by virtue of misuse of the scripture. Amazingly, Jack Deere claims that Deuteronomy 18 is not about prophets and that a prophet who makes a mistake is not a false prophet. And then some people might say, well, those are false prophets. They're not false prophets. No, I mean, a lot of people think Deuteronomy 18 means that if you make one mistake, you're a false prophet. Now, that is not true. That is simply not true. Deuteronomy 18 was not about uh, prophets. Moses was not saying, if a prophet makes a mistake, you kill him. He wasn't saying that at all. He's saying the one who presumes to be like me and then tells you to go after false gods, that's the prophet that's killed. Not the prophet that makes a mistake. That's not a prophet that makes a mistake. It's not a false prophet any more than a teacher that teaches something's wrong is not a false teacher. But it is clear that Deuteronomy 18 is all about prophets. And verse 20 clearly states, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of another, other gods must be put to death. So the criteria for killing a false prophet is not only him uh, getting people to follow other gods, but one who speaks things in God's name that he has not commanded them to say. Perhaps it would help if Jack Deere reread this passage more carefully. This type of argument is being used throughout the third wave to try to justify false prophecy. The Bible only uses the word mistake a few times, but uses the word sin over 900 times in the NIV. False prophecy is a sin against God, not a mistake. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Ariel Ministries comments on this issue. Now, if Jeremy 18 has nothing to do with prophets, then why did Moses say prophet like unto me? Why didn't he just say a leader like me or a theocratic leader like me? In other words, there were Hebrew words that he could have used if he didn't intend for this to be a prophetic passage. But if you look at both Deuteronomy chapter 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 18, he's dealing with prophets. He's giving Israel lessons on how to determine what the prophets are true or false. No two basic tests. First of all, the prophecy does not come to pass. It makes him a false prophet. But secondly, even if it does come to pass, even if he does signs and wonders, but he speaks things that contradict the written word of God, he's still a false prophet. And under Mosaic law, these prophets were to be stoned 
one mistake in your rock pile. It's unfortunate that these new prophets today, new apostles today, don't have to live under the Mosaic law, otherwise they wouldn't uh, survive very long. And the basic uh, the teaching of scripture is a prophet that makes a mistake is a false prophet. This one claims he's not a false prophet. God did not allow his prophets to make mistakes because what they were speaking was the very words of God. Dutch Sheets uses Acts 3.19 to claim that there will be a restoration of foundational apostles and revival in the end times. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 to 21. I'm going to do these very quickly. As soon as I get there I'll start reading. Acts 3.19, repent there and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times kairoses of refreshing, refreshing anasuxus, the blowing of the wind or the breath again is really the word, a fresh release of breath or wind, a kairos strategic time of the blowing of the wind may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the chronos. Here's, here's the other word. The first one is kairos. This is the chronos, the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. He says here we're on a path. We go from a blowing of the wind to a blowing of the wind to a blowing of the wind. We go from an awakening to an awakening, a restoration to a restoration, revival to revival, glory to glory, if you please, faith to faith, strength to strength. We are on a journey in the church before the coming of the Lord Jesus. We will fully express him in the earth. All things will be summed up in him. So we're in a process of all things being restored, reconstituted to his stated, declared order and purpose. Peter was trying to tell the leadership of Israel that they were guilty of crucifying the Messiah. Verse 21 says, He, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the time he comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Jesus Christ is still at the right hand of the Father until he comes again bodily in glory and power to rule and judge the earth. This is the restoration the speech by Peter is talking about, not restoration of apostles. The refreshing he's talking about in verse 19 comes as a direct result of repentance. The mention of repentance is completely absent from Dutch Sheets' use of the text, though it is a basis for salvation. To be revived, you have to first be vived or alive. To be born again, you must repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and obey Him as Lord. Sheets goes on to try to prove that the foundations of Christianity are destroyed so that they must be repaired by the new apostles using Isaiah 58 and 60, uh, 61. If they are destroyed, you have to start over. Or you have to do what Isaiah 58 and 61 says when it talks about us being repairers of the foundation, going back to the ancient paths that we walked in before, and we've got to restore, repair, rebuild those things because we can't just be cut off from them. So he brings these things to us as foundational anointings, and when they come together into their fullness, there's a power that just goes like this. Aside from the fact that practically all of Dutch Sheets theology is straight out of the New Age, Isaiah 58.12 is an allusion to both the rebuilding of the temple and Jerusalem, and also of the gospel message repairing the breach between God and man, and Jew and Gentile under the New Covenant. It's talking about raising up the age-old foundations. So it's not talking about building on a new foundation, but building on the old. The church is built on the foundation of the prophets, apostles, and the cornerstone Jesus Christ, and their teachings are written in the scriptures. Isaiah 58.12 is not talking about the restoration and building of new foundational apostolic authority. Isaiah 61.19 is about the same thing, with the addition of a prophecy about the Messiah in verses 1-3. to because of the salvation brought for us, bought for us by the anointed one, Jesus Christ, we can preach, in turn, preach the gospel and do the work of reconciliation and restoration uh, mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. This passage is not talking about restoring offices to the church, 
Since the foundational apostles who saw the risen Lord, who wrote scripture and who were martyred for the gospel, no longer exist today, nor could they. We are being built into a spiritual house, as it says in 1 Peter 2.5. But God does the building, as it says in Hebrews 3.4. If we are living in the end times, then the church is figuratively on the roof now. And we should not be laying again the foundation, as Hebrews 6.1 states. Examples of the application of a bad hermeneutic to the written word of God are legion throughout the New Apostolic Reformation and Third Wave, and we could do a whole series on just what we heard in the one set of National School of the Prophets video. But perhaps it might be helpful at this point to be reminded of the importance of the proper biblical interpretation and hermeneutics by Pastor P uh, Gary Gilley of Southern View Chapel in Springfield, Illinois. We find that they often use a faulty hermeneutic and exegesis. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Hermeneutics is the, the science that teaches the principles, laws, and methods of interpreting. We all use hermeneutics whenever we read anything, whether it's a newspaper, uh, a law book, or tax forms, a novel. We use hermeneutics. We approach that literature with some view on how we are to interpret that literature. The hermeneutic that we use in life, for the most part, is what we call the normal or literal hermeneutic. That is, we approach literature as if it could be understood in a normal way. There might be figures of speech, there might be metaphors, but all that is part of normal language and normal literature. And that's how we approach literature, if we want to understand it. But when it comes to the Bible throughout the ages, unfortunately, people have tried to come uh, with various types of hermeneutics that have distorted the scriptures. There has been the allegorical hermeneutic, uh, the devotional, the liberal, the neo-orthodox, and what I think is the most prevalent, uh, the one I like to call fairy tale hermeneutics, which means you come to the Bible and you make up what you wanted to believe, or what you wanted to say. Now, when any hermeneutical approach to scripture is used except for the normal and literal method, uh, we can literally twist the scriptures to mean anything we want it to mean. That's why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, he said, I want you to accurately handle the word of truth. I want you to cut it straight. I want you to go to the scriptures and find out what God says and then teach what God says. That leads us to his second word, a fancy word, exegesis, which simply means we go to the scriptures and find out what God says and take from the scriptures what God wants us to take. We don't come to the scriptures with our own preconceived ideas. We don't come to the scripture uh, to find what we want to find. We come to the scripture to find out what God wants to teach us. And then we take the scriptures literal and we believe what God has for us there. Now let me give you an example of how faulty hermeneutics and exegesis can distort the word of God. See Peter Wagner who has, by the way, been on the cutting edge of all sorts of heresies in modern times, uh, often misuses the scriptures. In his book, Engaging the Enemy, How to Fight and Defeat Territorial Spirits, he is teaching us his brand of so-called spiritual warfare. And in order to find some basis in scripture, he takes the reader back to the book of Joshua. And he says this, and I quote from page 98, Spying out the land is essential when warring for a city. Christians should walk or drive every major freeway, avenue, and road of their cities, praying and coming against demonic strongholds over every neighborhood. Even if you don't see instant results, keep the trumpets blowing. Always remember God is not slack concerning his promise. The walls will come down. Now most will recognize that Wagner is using uh, uh, Joshua 2 and Joshua 6 for his biblical base for spiritual warfare. Uh, in Joshua chapter 2, you recall, the spies from Israel went into the land to spy out the city of Jericho. In Joshua 6, in obedience to God's command, they go to Jericho, and they march around the city for a number of days. And on the last day, they march around a number of times, and they blow their trumpets, and the walls of Jericho fell flat. And that's a teaching of Joshua. So some will say, well, look, uh, Peter Wagner has based his uh, teaching of spiritual warfare on, on the book of Joshua. He has a biblical base. 
but is that the case? Let's go back and look at that hermeneutically. Uh, first of all, as we go to Joshua, we find that spying out the land was a very unique situation in the history of Israel. God didn't tell the people to spy out the land on other occasions. Uh, he doesn't go throughout the Old Testament telling them to spy out the land. In the New Testament, he never tells the church to spy out anything. And so why would we expect that spying out the land for demons would be the norm uh, today? Secondly, spying on people, not demons, was a context found in the book of Joshua. Uh, where are we told in Scripture to go spying for demons? Nowhere are we told to walk up and down streets in our cities looking for and praying over demonic strongholds. Thirdly, when Israel blew their trumpets, the literal walls of Jericho did fall flat, just as God said they would. But uh, where in Scripture are we told that the walls of demonic stronghold will blow, be blown flat by our trumpets? As a matter of fact, where in Scripture do we find any mention whatsoever of demonic strongholds? Uh, the strongholds of demons, that's a, uh, something that's been brought to the Scriptures beyond the Scriptures themselves anyway. That's not a scriptural teaching. Wagner assures us that God is not slack concerning his promise. The walls will come down. To Israel, that was true. God gave them a promise. God kept his promise. But that is not God's promise concerning demons today. Wagner is forcing the text to say what he wants it to say. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Joshua chapter 2 and chapter 6, you, you'll quickly realize that Wagner has made all this stuff up. He has used fairy tale hermeneutics. He has taken scripture out of context and forced it to say what he wants it to say. Now, if this were an isolated incident, if this were just a one individual or two that did this, we wouldn't worry much about it. But it's, it's becoming more and more the norm in evangelical and fundamental circles. We find the Christian landscape literally uh, swamped with those who claim the authority of scripture and even claim the sufficiency of scripture and yet are bringing their extra biblical teachings to the Word of God and are torturing and twisting the precious Word of God to make it mean anything they want it to mean. The sufficiency of Scripture and the authority of Scripture is under attack today, not just from the enemies of Scripture, but from those who claim to be its friends as well. And we need to be aware of this uh, today in the Christian church. There has always been an ecumenical and interfaith aspect to the New Apostolic Reformation methodology. Most NAR adherents have been working with Roman Catholics for years, not just on social issues, but on evangelism and discipleship. Since Billy Graham, many evangelists openly work with the Catholics to get them involved in crusades, only to send those professing faith back to the Roman Catholic Church if they say they're Catholics. But you know what? The Bible tells us they were not only to preach the gospel, but to disciple all nations, Matthew 28, 19. Agencies spreading the NAR method, such as YWAM, have been working with Catholics for many years and are now even wooing Muslims and other religions by teaching that we all worship the same God. This is being done in Islamic, Hindu, and many other First Nation cultures through the indigenous people's movement we will detail next. YWAM is now establishing categories like quote-unquote messianic Muslims, which I find to be an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Uh, and they do not have to recognize Jesus Christ is God, but can just add him on to their uh, Muslim beliefs, continue to pray in the mosques, read the Koran, follow their own religious traditions. I have direct information about this from a messianic Muslim. Mike Oppenheimer of Let Us Reason Ministries comments on this issue. We see a new type of evangelism used in missionary organizations. It's about doing missionary work in a completely new way unheard of before. An experimental way that is supposed to yield results where there were only a few results before. Now near the end of preparing an article I was writing on Messianic Muslims and these new ways of doing evangelism, I received a letter from someone who was a Muslim, specifically a Messianic Muslim. And he claimed to believe in the Bible and that Jesus was his Messiah. 
having a dialogue with someone who identified himself as a Messianic Muslim was an eye-opener, though he preferred to use the term Muslim. We had several exchanges, and what I noticed was that he did not regard the scripture as authoritative in any way for his religious practices. He claimed there are quite a few Messianic Muslims who believe in the crucifixion, and by his estimate, there was around 50 to 70 million Muslims that believe this. Now, he affirmed how the Quran talks more about Jesus than any other prophet, even Muhammad, how he would be resurrected, and how he would also uh, raise the dead and the miracles that he did. His mission was prophesied and confirmed by Muhammad, at least that's what he was telling me. Now the Quran calls Jesus the Messiah and the sole purpose of the Messiah's mission was not only to spread Allah's word but to pay the price as Allah promised the Jews a while beforehand. This is what he told me. He did not believe in original sin since there was no mention of it in any of the scriptures. Sin enters when a person sins not inherited by birth. But the main discrepancy was that Jesus was God. He did not believe that Jesus was God incarnate or a literal son of God. He called the Trinity pagan and quoted the Quran that says, far be it from God's grace that he should have a son for all in the heavens and the earth belong to the Lord. Claiming that the son was a little, uh, was a title that God gave King David, Jesus, as well as several other prophets. He also stated in these mosques they, that they teach from three holy books, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Koran. And he called all three scripture, and he said he, that they needed to be applied to all godly faiths. He sincerely believed this to be the truth. Now, despite my sending him the scriptures showing where he was wrong on these essential teachings, he did not change. Now, the Koran often contradicts the Bible more than it agrees. So it cannot accompany the Bible's revelation. Now, most Muslims will admit this. The Quran also contradicts numerous biblical persons and events on where and how they occurred, and especially on who Jesus is and what he said. Unless one has the Bible as their authority, things can become very confusing. Now, those who are converted should not still be reading the Quran and going to the mosque and bowing toward Mecca with others like they did before. To have them bow in an Islamic service when the mullah is calling out Allahs is not re true religious behavior of a converted person, of a believer. This is synthesizing of two religions. If you come through Jesus Christ by the gospel, then you have come to the true God. What this new evangelism is saying is that Muslims, Allah, is God already, and that they only have to adjust your, their wrong concepts of God by telling them that they can walk with Allah as if he's Yahweh and add a son to him. Now we need to be extra careful when discipling Muslims to Christ and not have any fusing of Islam with Christianity. And from what I've heard, there is a, a large falling away rate of those that are supposedly converted to Christianity from Islam. What we see, the genuine conversions in the book of Acts, they burned their books, forsaking what they once knew for the truth. There is no such thing as a Messianic Muslim. There are Messianic Jews because Christianity is a fulfillment of the Hebrew faith and scriptures, not the Muslim's Koran. If they believe in the Jesus of the Bible, then they are no longer Muslim, just like one would no longer be a Hindu or a Mormon. But today we have a synthesizing that is changing the core teachings of Christianity. We need to be aware of this and be informed as these changes in evangelism are taking place. They're also using this method with Hindus and other peoples. But you know what? This is not evangelism. This is anti-evangelism. It's universalism in another, in, in another guise. This goes against the core doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Just so the connection to the International Coalition of Apostles of the NAR is clear, Mike Bickle mentions YWAM as an agency working to spread the NAR message. We have 80 full-time workers. It's like YWAM or Campus Crusade. They've raised their own support. And they do it 50 hours a week. And we've got 150 more coming. They're raising their support. They're relocating there. I'm calling it an IHOP. That's right. International House of Prayer. IHOP Missions Base. And we'll have, uh, we've got 150 that are coming right now. So we have about 250 this time next year. Just like Campus Crusade or a Youth with a Mission deal, they've raised their support. They're missionaries. Our vision is to form them in teams 
of, uh, of 25 and send them to the cities of the earth. I mean, they've raised their support. They've already got their missionary support raised. We send them to the cities of the earth, and they're trained. But here's what I want to train them in. I want to train them, verse 4, in the realm of God's desire and God's beauty, critical to enjoyable prayer. Bill Hammond makes it clear that the NAR is into uh, ecumenism. Now, what does Billy Graham do in a great big public auditorium, gymnasium, I mean, I mean, stadium, when he gets a Catholic or Episcopalian activated the gift of eternal life, and they get the joy of the Lord and go back to their dead former church and get all excited? Now, as I look along the river of God, I see gigantic nets being formed. In some cases, they're huge megachurches. In other cases, there are citywide nets. In other cases, there are huge families of churches all over the world. God is supernaturally bringing together apostles, bringing together pastors, bringing together evangelists, teachers, prophets. Why? Because the harvest is so immense that if we're not somehow interlocked divinely, we'll lose part of the harvest. You can't resist it anymore. It's here to stay. Now, you go to some countries, the only way churches can maintain their membership is to make sure that they adopt the charismatic form of worship. You go to some countries, the Catholics are operating in the same way. The Methodists are operating in the same way. The Baptists are operating in the same way. Now the gift of the Holy Spirit is not restricted. It's just allowed to flow. What else is God doing in these days that you see? Well, I see a great move of unity. You know, the walls are truly falling. I see people loving each other, used to hate each other. I see uh, Catholics with Protestants. I see God doing racial reconciliation. They also confirm uh, by their statements that they are involved in establishing a global church. We release, we bless, we confirm the calling of the prophet the calling of the prophetess, the calling of the prophetic, and we welcome it into the global church of the world. There's a global prayer movement that is exploding and crescendoing. Wagner himself has had long ties to the Catholics. Quote, Traditionally, the message of the gospel in Latin America has appealed to the working class, but changes has, have begun to take place, and many uh, middle and upper class people are now opening their hearts to Jesus Christ. Some of this is happening through the Catholic charismatic movement. Unquote. That's C. Peter Wagner. Look at what God's doing. Ex excerpt uh, on, it's from, uh, on Regal Books, 1983. I've had a long association with YWAM on the mission field in the islands. YWAM has been promoting heretical books by third waivers like Rick Joyner and Franch Francis Frangipan, uh, and publishes books by George Otis Jr. and C. Peter Wagner, and hands out many others all over the islands to pastors and church leaders there, and everyone else. As of this taping, on the main YWAM.org website, they sell books by NAR proponents such as Ted Haggard, Cindy Jacobs, C. Peter Wagner, Dutch Sheets, Rick Marshall, David Canastrasi, George Otis Jr., Charles Kraft, Winky Pratney, Steve Hawthorne, John Dawson, Dawson, and Joy Dawson. They are actively inviting people out of biblical churches to go to third wave churches and events. In Micronesia, YWAM shared the responsibility and infamy of causing a split from our mission evangelical churches in one island when the Brownsville AOG people came there. YWAM people are actively proselytizing people from evangelical churches in another island to go to a Brownsville uh, style church. Many people in YWAM are no longer doing straight evangelism as some in YWAM have in the past, but are mainly involved these days in false spiritual warfare fair techniques, such as binding territorial spirits, blowing shofars on mountaintops, getting the Holy Spirit by impartation and through the mouth, going up to the hills with salt and water to reconcile men and women in the culture, uh, prayer walking, spiritual mapping, and all the rest of the unbiblical and even occultic methods of their mentors, C. Peter Wagner, John Dawson, and George Otis, Jr. Wagner presented the entire New Apostolic Reformation scenario to YWAM, uh, and I have notes from one meeting in 1999 in Colorado Springs with the University of the Nations of YWAM, 
where Wagner stated that he and other apostles are foundational to the church and told YWAM people to use Bill Hammond's book on apostles and prophets as reference, which also states the same thing. Here's what he told YWAM there, quote, The government of the church came into place with the recognition of the office of apostle. And then he quoted Bill Hammond as saying, Bill Hammond states in his book, Paul tells us that the ministries of apostles and prophets are foundational to the building of Christ's church, Ephesians 2, 20-22. They are a direct extension of the cornerstone, Jesus, uh, of the cornerstone Jesus, to give alignment and proper structure to God's building, the church. So any church which is established without an apostle or prophetic ministry will not have a proper foundation for uh, maximum growth. That reference was to Bill Hammond's book, Prophets and Personal Prophecy. So, YOM has been taught latter rain doctrines by the NIR leadership themselves, and are now spreading those doctrines as far as YOM reaches, which is very far indeed. Greg Robertson, a former YOM missionary, has a website informing people of the false doctrines YOM currently promotes. Listen to what Greg has to say about YWAM. In, uh, when a group went to the Borobudur Temple, and instead of uh, which is in J the island of Java, instead of sharing the gospel with people, they walked around it several times in prayer in silence. They had a code of silence. You were not allowed to speak with anybody. And one of the uh, young ladies that was with them broke their code of silence, began speaking with somebody, and she was disciplined. She was not allowed to continue. They went to several sites during their trip. She was not allowed to continue to other sites because she had broken their code of silence. Now, this is completely contrary to the idea that it's the Word of God that works in people's minds and hearts, and it's the Word of God that converts people, that the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God uh, to open eyes. And that's why we see in the, in the Bible that the Christians went everywhere preaching, and it was through their preaching of the Word that the Holy Spirit worked. And you see Paul, he's asking for boldness, that he can preach the word with boldness. Uh, we see where he's, he stayed in some places for a couple years, teaching them constantly. And he was teaching them, it wasn't, uh, he, apparently he didn't, I don't see anything about spiritual mapping where he was teaching them anything to do with these kind of new uh, revelations that are coming into the church. And perhaps that's why they have to have uh, this whole new concept that there is new revelation. Because if you go to the old revelation, it's not there. You have to take it to the old revelation and search for places in, in the Bible that will support this present day teaching. Steve Mitchell, a missionary who just returned from India, has had many experiences with YWAM. In Jude 3, we're told to contend earnestly or fight hard for the faith. It means that we as Believers in Christ Jesus and upholders of his word are to test all things. We're to exercise discernment in the teachings that come. We're to, we're to test the teachings of those who are within the church and without the church against the word of God. There's a group, Youth with a Mission, very famous missionary uh, organization that mobilizes teams of young people to go all over the world. They're acting on the vision that was given to uh, Lauren Cunningham in a very popular book. One of the standard works that students in the DTSs, the Discipleship Training Schools, are asked to read. And it's the content of some of these writings, and it's the lives of some of these men that should give great concern to us who are wanting to see the Word of God go out and wanting to see the true gospel preached in, in all the nations. As a missionary in India for the last few years, I've, I've been a participant in, in just that. I've been teaching and preaching and, and working a lot with young people. And before that, here in the islands, I was in the Calvary Chapel movement as a youth pastor. Throughout the extent of my ministry, I've seen a lot of people and I've got a lot of friends that have gone to Youth with a Mission, gone to these various schools, and have been sent to various places on the globe to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, there's an effect that happens in the lifestyles and in the doctrines that are being taught in these schools. And, of course, subsequently, these teams then take what they're taught in these intensive training sessions to these other people. They're taking them to non-believers, and they're teaching, some, in some cases, some very unbiblical and strange practices. Now, this should give us concern because we need to show discernment. 
We need to really test these things by the Word of God. And sadly, a lot of the writings and the teachings in YWAM do not pass the test. In fact, they could be considered doctrinally dangerous and things that we should not ever seek to send our young people in our churches to go and pursue or be taught. Now, there's a man named John Dawson who's very popular in the movement and one of the standard works in these training schools is his book, Taking Our Cities for God. Among other things, it, it lays the groundwork and the framework for what has now emerged as what is called the third wave movement. It speaks a lot of unbiblical principles in spiritual warfare, such as spiritual mapping, which is the, uh, the practice of walking around the communities and, and the places and, and discovering information about them to specifically and aggressively do warfare prayer against those things, taking territories for Christ, marking out areas that, that, will, be, that will be sacred to where the gospel will be presented, and coming against, in, in sometimes very uh, adamant ways, against the territorial spirits that supposedly lurk over these areas. Now, the Bible speaks a bit about territorial spirits, but it never shows in any case, in any of the books of the Bible or in any of the characters therein, Jesus Christ or the apostles, the Old Testament prophets, none of them ever used these demons to focus their prayers against. But yet, John Dawson in his book, much of it is teaching young people how to do that. So they go to the places across the planet and they begin to rail and, and, and pray aggressive prayers against demons and bind spiritual forces. Well, how do they find out who the spiritual entities are that are controlling these areas and tribes and people groups? It's through extra biblical revelation. In fact, much of which is taught in this book. Again, we have Is That Really You, God? by Lauren Cunningham. It's the story of YWAM. But in it, he also explains that there's a new form of guidance that many of them are using. And he learned this in New Zealand after also being taught by his mother. But it, it involves getting together and having prayer and waiting for things to come through, messages to come into the mind or just Bible references or in, in some cases of very strange images and visions and then trying to interpret them together as it being the voice of God and moving accordingly. Here's the problem much of what comes through some of these prayer sessions, much of what is in written in Dawson's and Cunningham's books is unbiblical. It comes from a source outside the Bible. And so therefore, it's open not only to being, we need to be very skeptical, but it's, it's open to demonic influence. And some of the doctrines that you'll read in there, they're just, they go against what scripture teaches. And whenever we see a situation like that, it shouldn't be something that we're praising. It shouldn't be something that we're encouraging. It shouldn't be something we're financially supporting. And especially it should not be an environment where we should send the young people from our church into. One more recent area of uh, doctrinal problems in Dawson's writings involves the reconciliation. He is now a part of a, an international reconciliation movement which teaches and mobilizes teams to go throughout the world into certain geographical areas and do rituals to undo past sins or past blemishes in the spiritual tablet of the land. Uh, they need to do communion in, in places to, quote, undo the powers of darkness. They need to make covenants with each other between people groups. An example of this is uh, YWAMs participated in, in Muslim and Christian reconciliation walks, where Muslims and Christians come together not to dialogue about the gospel, not to be evangelized with the true gospel from the Christians, but to the Christians will, will apologize for the Crusades. They will apologize for other, other areas of, of history where Christianity and Islam has, has collided. And they make covenants with one another, and they also bring into a thing called in, uh, national repentance. Uh, this has been practiced in India by several teams, and I have testimony from YWAMers there who are involved in just that. It's getting in front of a large crowd of people at their gatherings, and they begin to identify with the sins of the nation of India and then make a covenant before God and repent for them. Now, we don't see anything like this in the Bible in the way that they're doing it in YWAM. We're not to identify with the sins of anyone, okay? But they believe that God has called them, and they're being taught in these DTSs, that God has called them to vicariously, in a way, atone for the sins of the people that, in the land that they're ministering. By that, I mean they go before God and they repent for the people and they're teaching that this is a prerequisite for evangelizing the people. 
So rather than the people of that area actually repenting and understanding their personal need for the Savior and the personal grievousness of their sin before God, uh, you have a group going into their communities representing them before God, which again doesn't save anyone. These other things that, that Dawson brings about and teaches in the DTSs to the young people involves the spiritual mapping, it involves the warfare principles of C. Peter Wagner, which in their embryonic form in 1989, when Taking Our Cities for God came out, it sounds and reads just like a primer for the third wave strategic warfare principles involving all manner of unbiblical things and the underpinnings of the entire book in many cases, in many uh, situations in that book are stories and testimony of being guided by sources beyond the Bible, by being informed about the spiritual climate of a city or, or whatever, uh, by forces that, that go beyond scripture. There's a lot of information that's given and it takes on sort of a Gnostic feel that God would be guiding them in such a personal, private way, independent of any example we see in Scripture. And these things need to give us great concern. There's a lot of other teachings within YWAM. And when you get into actually what is being done in practice, there's just so many stories and so many uh, incidents that we could sit and recount for you of uh, these teams being taught unbiblical things to go out and teach. Now, it's no secret in uh, 1999 at the University of the Nation's Leaders Workshop, C. Peter Wagner was a keynote speaker. Lauren Cunningham was identified to the people there as an apostle or the apostle of YWAM. In addition to that, there was other material that goes along with the new apostles and prophets doctrines that were being taught right there to the leaders of YWAM. This, in turn, of course, is dispensed among all the bases that these leaders are overseers of. It will eventually filter into the classroom teaching times and the prayer sessions and all of these practices come together to present a threat to a biblical understanding of spiritual warfare, of prayer and guidance, and of Christian practice. The young people are the recipients of these error and then they go and propagate it. I can speak firsthand from experience in India that whatever is sent over there and whatever is preached over there does a thousand times more damage than it might here in America. People will believe and teach almost anything in a lot of circles there and YWAM has caught on very large there among the people. Now I'm not against a lot of the social work that's been done by YWAM, a lot of the help that they've done medically and uh, you know providing some services for the poor. I think that's great. My problem lies in their doctrinal content and what's being spread and taught in the DTSs. Bring this issue up to a YWAM leader or bring it to the attention of some of the higher leaders like uh, myself and several others have done and you basically get tarred and feathered. There's really a, an animosity towards anyone who would question the validity of some of YWAM's practices. And the sad part is there's really a failure on a large part of the leadership to implement any change. When you turn on the television in America or in India and you see Lauren Cunningham, the founder of YWAM, on with Benny Hinn on, on what's becoming a semi-regular basis and an ongoing basis, then it would lead anyone, any casual observer, to conclude that there is some kind of a collaboration happening between YWAM and the ministry of a false prophet like Benny Hinn. Now in 2001, here in uh, Honolulu, Many gazed in horror at the Neil Blaisdell Center's Benny Hinn show when he brought Joy Dawson of YWAM, totally connected with YWAM and one of the uh, founders, if you will, of, of a lot of what's being taught there and propagated now. And Benny Hinn announced the plan of YWAM and his ministry to work together to reach the youth of Hawaii. Now, however you slice that, if you're a discerning Christian, if you're a person in leadership, if you're anyone working with the youth, this should keep you up at night. This should be something that we need to act on and really ask the leaders of YWAM to give an account for. This has also been done. Letters have been written. They've been received. And in almost every case, they've been rejected. Given the obvious connection and working relationships with the apostolic and prophetic movement, 
and given a lot of the teachings that you'll find in the DTSs and the reading materials that are given to the young people, including some of the works and the, the, uh, the book offerings of these false prophets, we must conclude that there must be other safer avenues for sending our youth to the mission field. It mu there must be other organizations where your church can partner with that with good conscience we could be reasonably assured that they will be given clean doctrine and we will have leaders that will be dealing with our young people who really have a concern for doctrinal truth and purity and who will take the stands needed in their own organization. As one of the local leaders of YWAM here exhorted a bunch of Calvary pastors in 2000 at a, at a pastor leaders conference, he shared, we must deal with the error in our organization or it will return to deal with you. However, when questioned on many of the errors in, in YWAM, there's a different story there. So we need to be careful because as the ecumenical alliances grow within YWAM with the Roman Catholic Church, with the word faith movement infiltrating, and with their partnership with the third wave group and the new apostles and prophets, we need to say, give an account for why they're teaching that and why they're promoting that to our young people. And we need to withhold sending our youth to this group until action is taken. In this way, we will honor God as we contend earnestly for the faith. There is an agenda within the New Apostolic Reformation to pull in all indigenous people groups through shows put on by First Nations peoples with regalia, drums, dancing, chants, chanting, and so forth. You may have noticed in a preceding section of this video that some indigenous people organizations are involved in Mission America. Richard Twiss of Wachone International is one of the indigenous ambassadors of Wagner and his groups. His ministry and books are endorsed by third waivers like Tommy Tenney, John Dawson of YWAM, C. Peter Wagner, uh, Francis Frangipan, Charles Kraft, Terry LeBlanc, and many others. And the source of that is Wachoni International website. There are other organizations and events involved, and you can see these by following the links on Wachoni and other websites. Recently, on the Word to the World uh, radio program by Danny Lehman, director of YWAM Honolulu, Three of the key promoters of the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous Peoples were featured, namely Richard Twiss, a Lakota Sioux Indian from Wachone International, Leon Siu, a uh, native Hawaiian of uh, Aloha Keakua, and uh, Terry LeBlanc, director of My People International, a Mi'kmaq um, Acadian Indian from uh, Canada. The World Christian Gathering of Indigenous Peoples uh, event uh, was held October 2002 in Honolulu and Hilo, Hawaii. Some of the stated goals of these gatherings was to teach indigenous peoples that God is redeeming cultures. In fact, that God has created, has created cultures. The claim is that the gospel was already evident before Western uh, missionaries came in contact with indigenous cultures. Therefore, Western missionaries are primarily blamed and must re repent of bringing Western culture with them, which ruined the godly societies God, uh, God had already uh, put into place. So the goal is for indigenous people groups, now called First Nations, to get together and assert their redeemed cultures by way of regalia and, and uh, cultural shows throughout the world because they're the only ones who can effectively reach out to the third, two-thirds world and finish the task of world evangelization, which will usher in the return of Christ. Now these notions are consistent with those of the New Apostolic Reformation, as this indigenous people's movement is directly tied to C. Peter Wagner's agendas. Richard Twist stated in his Wachone International Smoke Signals e-newsletter dated uh, September 10, 2002 regarding the World Christian Gathering on Indigenous Peoples that, quote, this will be a historic gathering as uh, key apostolic indigenous leaders uh, prayerfully help chart the course of the work of God among indigenous peoples for the next several decades, unquote. This is proof positive that one of the major goals of uh, this group is to promote foundational apostolic control of churches in the th two-thirds world, following the agenda of the New Apostolic Reformation. 
The problem is, these, are, these ideas are riddled with false teaching. First of all, there's no mention in the Bible about redeeming cultures. God will redeem the nation of Israel, but today he's in the business of redeeming people. Individuals. Cultures are the traditions of men, which the Bible tells us are in opposition to the commands of God, Mark 7, 8 through 9. The second erroneous assumption is that missionaries are solely responsible for turning indigenous cultures toward Western culture. Though it is true that Western missionaries are coming from a Western uh, worldview and sometimes made the mistake of teaching Western cultural values instead of biblical ones, a careful study of history will show that secular sailors, whalers, traders, and others who plied their trade among indigenous peoples were often the ones that caused most of the problems. It must also be admitted that many indigenous peoples welcomed the modern world conveniences that come with westernization and are only rec recently waking up to the fact that with those conveniences come the inevitable loss of a simpler lifestyle. Are the missionaries then the main people to blame? Well, according to these gathering representatives, the answer is yes. The third false idea is the idea that putting on cultural shows can further the gospel message. It can certainly attract people, but the gospel must be clearly preached, otherwise it just becomes a secular exercise in First Nations unity. Then there is a slant toward dominionism, as often espoused by YWAM and these men, that they must Christianize the whole world before Christ comes. First of all, the term world evangelization, though it sounds like the word evangelism, bears little resemblance to preaching the gospel to all nations. It's really about Christianizing and redeeming cultures and preparing the world for Christ to return because allegedly he won't come back until this Christianizing work is done. But the Bible's clear that the end times will be, we'll see a great apostasy, a falling away, rather than a great revival. Then Jesus Christ will return bodily to rule and judge the earth and set up his kingdom. Yes, the whole world will hear the gospel message before Christ returns, but it's also clear from the scripture that few will find the narrow way. To familiarize, to familiarize the viewer with the men leading this particular indigenous people's movement, let me give you a few of the teachings of the men involved. Richard Twiss. He stated on the 700 Club recently, while being interviewed by Gordon Robertson, that the great spirit of the Indians is the same as the Holy Spirit. Is the great spirit triune? Is the great spirit of the, uh, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I think not. Twist claims, Indigenous people have perpetually been put in the position of the mission field, never fully recognized as had been giving gifts and callings and anointings to be co-equal participants in this great thing we call the Great Commission. You know, there are two false assumptions here that are used throughout the radio show. The first false idea is that indigenous peoples had gifts, callings, and anointings before the gospel had even pre been preached to them. You cannot have a gift of the Spirit without being born again. The second is that there are many anointings. There's clearly only one anointing of the Holy Spirit that all true believers share, and that's the anointing of the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. Furthermore, it's implied that missions uh, still don't recognize the importance of indigenous people in reaching the world with the gospel. This is patently false. Many missionary, missions and missionaries have long encouraged, both in word and with finances, any mission efforts by indigenous peoples. Leon Su. He has said that he prays to the Hawaiian bird god Io as Jehovah God. Is a bird YHWH? These kinds of ideas come from a book called Perpetuated in Righteousness, written by a friend and co-organizer of the events uh, by the name of Daniel Kikawa. In the book, Kikawa makes up an elaborate mythology about Hawaiian culture, claiming that Hawaiians already were worshiping God in the form of the bird god Io long before missionaries arrived. That's page 18, uh, 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 paragraph 2. He claims that the Polynesian people were descended from Israel, page 62. That they can trace their genealogies back to Noah, page 72 through 73. And that they knew the gospel because it was written in the stars page 55. This is all fanciful mythology. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Aerial Ministries says of Kikawa's work, 
quote, to claim that Polynesian peoples may have been part of the nation of Israel for a time is one of the more horrendous assumptions in the book. There's absolutely no truth to this whatsoever. Sioux also states on the program, These are uh, clues that we felt God had left and evidence that he had left as well as processes he had left in which our Hawaiian people can respond in their natural way to God and, and really set things right between them and God. So Siu was also claiming that the Hawaiian people had a way of salvation prior to the arrival of the missionaries. But how could they believe without a preacher? 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. Romans 10.14-15 says, how, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one on whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, there's, n there's no acknowledgement on the radio program of the missionaries whose beautiful feet brought the good news to, the, to practically the whole world starting in the 1800s. The other man, Terry LeBlanc, on the program states this. Uh, there's a myth that we have labored under for, for centuries in indigenous communities, and the myth is that we were a godless heathen people. Of course, those Canadian Indians who are saved are no longer heathens, and I know no true Christian who is claiming this. But looking at the sum of what LeBlanc teaches, he's actually claiming that they were never heathen. This is patently false, as they did not have the gospel message and were worshipping false demonic gods, including the false god, the Great Spirit. He goes on to say, mm -hmm. And yet all brings glory to God in its own special way, and that's true of human beings and cultures as well. So all cultures bring glory to God? What about Nazi Germany? What about Saddam Hussein in Iraq? What about cannibals in Papua New Guinea? What about the American culture? Does any culture bring glory to God? <clears throat> Not even Israel is bringing glory to God today, let alone the Gentiles. We must strive to evangelize individuals who will, in turn, try to affect change in their cultures but more importantly, effect change in their own lives and apply biblical precepts to any cultural activities in which they participate, being salt and light to the world. So you can see from these few quotes that this movement is unbiblical and is trying to entice the rest of the two-thirds world into the new apostolic reformation by espousing the same false doctrines set forth by people like C. Peter Wagner, Charles Kraft, George Otis Jr., and John Dawson. YWAM is promoting these organizations and events all over the world. And people like Richard Twiss are traveling everywhere with these ideas that are actually hindering the true presentation of the gospel. The blurring of lines between the false gods of the past and Jehovah God, YHWH, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great I Am, is reprehensible. The third wave manifestations in these indigenous gatherings are patently lacking the fruit of the spirit of self-control and peace, and instead glorify the traditions of men.
perfectly clear about my support for indigenous churches and individuals. I'm an MK. I speak an indigenous language fluently and was so much a part of that culture that I was asked to change my citizenship at one time. I'm still working as a full-time uh, missionary with people groups from that area of the world and I regularly encourage the indigenous churches that have been nationalized for decades to reach out to their own area and far beyond. I am in the business of discipling indigenous peoples and finding ways to help them evangelize in whatever ways the Lord leads. But we must not endorse movements that for all their good intentions are a mixture of good, unbiblical, and heretical theology. How can we effectively bring the gospel if that gospel is tainted by the world, the flesh, and the devil? We as Christians must stand firm in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We must not get involved in ecumenical movements that look like the world, act like the world, and instead of bringing the word to the world, are bringing the world to the world. Thank you.